Proficiency in cardiac auscultation is developed through understanding the genesis of heart sounds and murmurs and through clinical experience. This presentation is designed to increase the skill of the physician at the bedside by reviewing theoretical concepts and presenting examples of heart sounds and murmurs in health and disease. This material is correlated with the text, Auscultation of the Heart. There are five types of heart sounds, namely valve closure sounds, valve opening sounds, ejection sounds, ventricular filling sounds, and extracardiac sounds. The valve closure sounds are represented by the first and second heart sounds. The first heart sound is produced by closure of the mitral and tricuspid valves. The second heart sound by closure of the aortic and pulmonary valves. The first heart sound is heard best at the apex. This sound is lower in pitch and longer than the second heart sound. Compare these normal sounds with a heart rate at 40 and then again at 80 per minute. Refer to figure 20. Systole begins with the first sound and ends with a second. An auscultatory event occurring within this interval is systolic in time. The first heart sound may be softer than normal. A thick chest wall, pleural or pericardial effusion, diminished transmission, and a soft first heart sound may be heard. Severe myocardial disease limits the force of ventricular contraction and also valve closure thereby producing a soft first heart sound. The following illustration is from a normal subject with a thick chest wall. See figure 20. A soft first heart sound may be generated when the PR interval is long. The mitral and tricuspid leaflets float upward and almost close during the time it takes the ventricles to be activated. When the ventricles finally contract, the remaining closing movements of the valves are so limited that a soft first heart sound is produced. Listen to a soft first heart sound in a patient with a prolonged PR interval of 0.20 seconds. See figure 21. The first heart sound may be louder than normal. Healthy individuals after exercise and patients with hyperthyroidism and severe anemia may demonstrate a loud first heart sound. The next illustration records the loud first heart sound in a normal subject following vigorous exercise. The first heart sound is loud when the PR interval is short. Ventricular contraction takes place when the tricuspid and mitral leaflets are depressed deep within the ventricular cavities. The closing excursions of the leaflets are then quite forceful and a loud first heart sound is produced. Listen to a loud first heart sound in a patient with a PR interval of 0.12 seconds. Refer to figure 22. Patients with mitral stenosis have a loud and sharp first heart sound. Ordinarily, the tricuspid leaflets close after the mitral, but in mitral stenosis, the mitral movements are delayed and the sound is superimposed on the tricuspid sound. Fibrotic leaflets and high left atrial pressures also contribute to this loud, sharp first heart sound, which is now heard. Refer to figure 20. Splitting of the first heart sound may be normal. This occurs when mitral and tricuspid valve closure are separated by a sufficient interval to be heard independently. This splitting is heard best at the apex or along the lower left sternal border. Splitting is conspicuous in patients with right bundle branch block. 
Listen to the split first heart sound in a normal, healthy subject. Refer to figure 20. The second heart sound is best examined at the base of the heart, at the pulmonary and aortic valve areas. The second heart sound may be softer than normal in both of these locations. This occurs in thick-chested subjects, in the presence of pleural or pericardial effusion, or in patients with severe myocardial disease. Remember, the first heart sound is also soft under these circumstances. The recording of a soft first and second heart sound is taken from a patient with severe myocardial disease. In the second right interspace, when aortic valvular stenosis is present, the second heart sound is soft. Listen to this example. You will note that the murmur of aortic stenosis has been removed. At the aortic valve area, the second heart sound is louder than normal when the pressure in the aorta is high. This recording is taken from a patient with systolic and diastolic hypertension. Note the tambour quality to aortic valve closure. The second heart sound is often louder at the second left inner space in patients with pulmonary hypertension. Loud pulmonic valve closure, P2, is noted in patients with primary and secondary pulmonary hypertension. Listen to the loud single second heart sound in a patient with primary pulmonary hypertension. Splitting of the second heart sound at the pulmonic area is normal because aortic valve closure occurs before pulmonary valve closure. Splitting of the second heart sound increases on inspiration. Inspiration delays pulmonary valve closure, and splitting is conspicuous. Listen to a normal subject with splitting of the second heart sound at the pulmonic area. You will note that on inspiration, splitting is wide, and on expiration, a single heart sound is heard. Refer to figure 27. Inspiration, expiration, inspiration, expiration. Abnormally wide splitting of the second heart sound is produced by any condition which delays pulmonary valve closure. This may occur in patients with right bundle branch block, pulmonary valvular stenosis, and atrial septal defect. Splitting is also abnormally wide when aortic valve closure occurs earlier than normal. This may occur in patients with severe mitral regurgitation. This is an example of abnormally wide splitting of the second heart sound in a patient with a right bundle branch block. Refer to figure 27. Inspiration. Expiration. Inspiration. Expiration. In atrial septal defect, abnormally wide splitting remains relatively fixed throughout all phases of respiration. Listen to a patient with an atrial septal defect. You'll note that splitting of the second heart sound is abnormally wide and relatively fixed. The murmur has been removed. See figure 28. Inspiration. Expiration. Inspiration. Expiration. 
Paradoxical splitting of the second heart sound occurs in patients with left bundle branch block, aortic stenosis, and severe systemic hypertension. In these patients, aortic valve closure is delayed, occurring after pulmonary valve closure. Splitting at the pulmonic area is wider on expiration than inspiration. Paradoxical splitting is now heard in a patient with left bundle branch block. Refer to figure 29. Inspiration. Expiration. Inspiration. Expiration. The valve opening sounds in normal healthy subjects are not audible. However, in patients with mitral or tricuspid stenosis, the opening sound is produced in early diastole. This is termed an opening snap. In mitral stenosis, the opening snap is heard best along the left sternal border and at the apex. In tricuspid stenosis, it is located near the midline, just to the left of the xiphoid area or to the right of the lower sternum. The earlier the opening snap occurs after aortic valve closure, the greater the obstruction at the mitral orifice. Listen to the opening snap in a patient with mitral stenosis. Also, note the loud and sharp first heart sound. Refer to figure 32. Now, listen to a patient with severe mitral stenosis. The opening snap is early, measuring 0 0.06 seconds. Ventricular filling sounds include the normal third heart sound, ventricular and atrial diastolic gallops. In normal healthy subjects, Careful listening with a bell of the stethoscope lightly applied to the apex may reveal a physiologic third heart sound. These faint third sounds occur in diastole after the second heart sound. Listen to a normal third heart sound. See figure 34. The abnormal ventricular diastolic gallop appears during the passive ventricular filling phase later than the opening snap. The loud, low-pitched gallop is best heard with a bell of the stethoscope applied to the apex. It is often the first clinical finding of heart failure. This recording is taken from a patient with severe heart failure. Note the loud ventricular diastolic gallop. Refer to figure 37. Atrial gallops occur during atrial contraction preceding the first heart sound. The atrial gallop is conspicuous in patients with coronary heart disease, hypertension, or in patients with a prolonged PR interval. Listen to an atrial gallop. You will note the low-pitched sound preceding the first heart sound. See figure 37. Ejection sounds are produced by the sudden rush of blood into the aorta or pulmonary artery. The ejection sounds occur in early systole after the first heart sound. An aortic ejection sound is heard best over the aortic area and is well transmitted to the apex. This early systolic sound occurs in patients with aortic stenosis, coarctation of the aorta, or tetralogy of Fallot. This recording of a high-pitched aortic ejection sound was taken from a patient with coarctation of the aorta. Refer to figures 39 and 41. Pulmonic ejection sounds are heard best at the pulmonary area. 
These high frequency sounds occurring after the first heart sound are conspicuous in patients with pulmonary stenosis, idiopathic dilatation of the pulmonary artery, and in a dilated pulmonary artery secondary to pulmonary hypertension. Extracardiac sounds deserve mention. These sounds have their origin outside the cardiac chambers. These precordial sounds are high frequency or clicky, occurring in mid or late systole. The cause of the late systolic sound, which is generally best heard at the apex, is obscure and is sometimes present in normal subjects. Listen to the late systolic sound in a healthy subject. See figures 43 and 44. A pericardial knock is an extracardiac sound. It occurs in early diastole and is heard best at the lower left sternal border. The knock occurs when a calcified pericardium limits ventricular distensibility during passive ventricular filling. Curious high frequency sounds are also produced by prosthetic valves. Listen to a patient with such a mitral prosthesis. You will hear the prosthetic first sound, a normal second sound, and a prosthetic opening snap as the ball valve opens. A murmur arising between the first and second heart sound is systolic in time. There are four types of systolic murmurs, namely ejection, pan-systolic, early systolic, and late systolic. The ejection mid-systolic murmur is generally caused by a rush of blood through the aortic or pulmonary valves or through the outflow tracts of either ventricle. This murmur begins after the first heart sound and ends before the second sound. The murmur is crescendo, decrescendo, and varies from a soft or grade one to a very loud or grade six when it can be heard with a stethoscope just removed from the chest wall. The ejection mid-systolic murmur of aortic stenosis is best heard at the aortic area in the second right inner space. Aortic valve closure is soft. Listen to this murmur. It is grade three in intensity. See figure 49. A short ejection mid-systolic murmur is also heard in patients with essential vascular hypertension. This murmur is heard best at the second right inner space and the second heart sound is loud. The recording is taken from a patient with systemic hypertension. Note the short ejection mid-systolic murmur and loud aortic second sound. Refer to figure 60A. The ejection mid-systolic murmur best heard at the pulmonary area or second left inner space is suggestive of pulmonary stenosis. Pulmonary valve closure is delayed and abnormally wide splitting of the second heart sound is conspicuous. Note that the splitting increases with inspiration and the second component or pulmonary valve closure is soft. See figure 61. Inspiration. Expiration. Inspiration. Expiration. An ejection mid-systolic murmur of atrial septal defect is also heard at the pulmonic area. In these patients, however, the second heart sound is widely split, but the degree of splitting does not increase with inspiration. This recording is from a patient with an atrial septal defect. Note the grade two ejection systolic murmur and abnormally wide and relatively fixed split second heart sound. Refer to figure 70. Inspiration. Expiration. Inspiration. Expiration. 
In patients with pulmonary hypertension and a dilated pulmonary artery, a short ejection mid-systolic murmur is heard best at the second or third left interspace. A pulmonic ejection sound sometimes introduces the short murmur and pulmonary valve closure is accentuated. This is an illustration of the findings in idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. Note the pulmonic ejection sound introduces a short systolic murmur and loud pulmonary valve closure is prominent. Occasionally, an ejection mid-systolic murmur, which is heard best at the aortic area, may be well transmitted to the apex. The murmur in this area is sometimes higher pitched or musical. This recording is taken from a patient with severe aortic stenosis. Note the musical quality of a mid-systolic murmur recorded at the apex. A pan-systolic murmur is produced by abnormal flow of blood from a high pressure to a low pressure chamber during systole. The pan-systolic murmur begins with a first heart sound and ends with a second sound. Loudness varies from grade one to six. The pan-systolic murmur of mitral regurgitation is heard best at the apex and is well transmitted into the left axilla. Listen to a grade three pan-systolic murmur at the apex in a patient with mitral regurgitation. Refer to figure 83. In patients with tricuspid regurgitation, the pan-systolic murmur is heard at the fourth left interspace to the left of the sternum. In contrast to mitral regurgitation, loudness increases with inspiration. Listen to the effect of inspiration on the pan-systolic murmur in a patient with tricuspid regurgitation. See figure 91. Inspiration. Expiration. Inspiration. Expiration. A pan-systolic murmur is also produced by a ventricular septal defect with a left to right shunt. This murmur is heard best at the fourth left interspace. The second heart sound at the pulmonary area is sometimes widely split because pulmonary valve closure is delayed. Listen to such a murmur. Refer to figure 94. pan-systolic murmur of a ventricular septal defect with severe pulmonary hypertension becomes softer and may disappear when the left to right shunt changes to a predominant right to left shunt. At the same time, the second heart sound, or pulmonary valve closure, becomes loud. The early systolic murmur begins immediately after the first heart sound and ends in mid-systole. The loudness of these murmurs varies from grade two to grade four. The murmur is generally decrescendo. The early systolic murmur has been heard in patients with small ventricular septal defects, mitral regurgitation, and in normal healthy subjects. This is a recording of an early systolic murmur, grade two, from a patient with a small ventricular septal defect. Refer to figure 100. The late systolic murmur begins after mid-systole and crescendos to the second heart sound. It varies from grade two to four. It is generally heard at the apex and may be caused by mild or moderate mitral regurgitation. It is also heard in patients with left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, coarctation of the aorta, papillary muscle dysfunction, and in normal healthy subjects. This recording of a late systolic murmur 
is from a patient with mild mitral regurgitation. Refer to figure 105A. Diastolic murmurs are heard between the second and next first heart sound. The diastolic murmurs are classified as early, mid, and late. The loudness of these murmurs varies from grade one to four. Early diastolic murmurs begin with a second heart sound. These murmurs are decrescendo and are caused by aortic or pulmonary valve regurgitation. In rheumatic aortic regurgitation, the murmur is loudest at the third and fourth left interspace. The early diastolic murmur of syphilitic aortic regurgitation and aortic aneurysm are sometimes louder at the fourth right interspace. Short ejection mid-systolic murmurs generally accompany these early diastolic murmurs. This recording was made from a patient with severe aortic regurgitation. Note the short ejection mid-systolic murmur and the high-pitched decrescendo blowing diastolic murmur of aortic regurgitation. Refer to figure 109. When the early diastolic murmur has a musical or seagull quality, retroversion or perforation of an aortic leaflet is suggested. Listen to this murmur. Refer to figure 114. The early diastolic murmur of pulmonary hypertension is heard best at the second and third left interspace. Pulmonic valve closure is accentuated. This recording was taken from a patient with severe pulmonary hypertension. Note the high-pitched decrescendo blowing diastolic murmur of pulmonary regurgitation. Refer to figure 116. A mid, late diastolic murmur is suggestive of mitral or tricuspid stenosis. The murmur of mitral stenosis generally begins with the opening snap, is decrescendo, and is accentuated in pre-systole, ending with a loud and sharp first heart sound. The loudness and length of the murmur increase as the obstruction progresses. The diastolic murmur of mitral stenosis is sometimes heard only in the left lateral position after coughing or after exercise. Listen to the mid-diastolic murmur of moderately severe mitral stenosis. The recording was made at the apex. Note the loud first heart sound and mid-diastolic murmur. See figure 120. In patients with severe mitral stenosis, the mid-diastolic murmur is louder and longer with pre-systolic accentuation. The first heart sound is loud and sharp, and the opening snap is early. Listen to a patient with severe mitral stenosis. See figure 121. The late diastolic or pre-systolic murmur of mitral stenosis disappears in patients with atrial fibrillation. The diastolic murmur begins with the opening snap, ending in late diastole. The first heart sound is loud and sharp, and an opening snap is prominent. Listen to a recording of mitral stenosis with atrial fibrillation. See figure 122.
The mid-diastolic murmur may be absent in patients with severe mitral stenosis and a reduced cardiac output. The loud first heart sound and early opening snap remain. Listen to a recording from a patient with severe mitral stenosis and congestive failure. The murmur is absent. The mid-diastolic murmur of tricuspid stenosis is similar to mitral stenosis. This murmur, however, is heard best to the right of the sternum. Observe the effect of inspiration, increasing the loudness of the tricuspid stenotic murmur. Refer to figure 123. Inspiration. Expiration. Inspiration. Expiration. Short, mid-diastolic murmurs are caused by increased flow across the mitral or tricuspid valves. The short, mid-diastolic murmur occurs in patients with large left-to-right shunts, patent ductus arteriosus, and in severe mitral regurgitation. Note the pansystolic murmur and the short mid-diastolic murmur taken from a patient with severe mitral regurgitation. Refer to figure 125. Various combinations of systolic and diastolic murmurs may be heard. In a patient with aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation, this recording demonstrates an ejection mid-systolic murmur with a high-pitched early decrescendo diastolic murmur. See figures 128 and 129. Combined systolic and diastolic murmurs occur in patients with mitral regurgitation and mitral stenosis. The pansystolic murmur is consistent with mitral regurgitation and the mid and late diastolic murmur with mitral stenosis. Refer to figure 124. Continuous murmurs extend from the first heart sound through the second heart sound and continue to the next first heart sound. These continuous murmurs may be innocent. This is an illustration of a venous hum recorded at the right supraclavicular area. During the recording, the murmur disappears when the internal jugular vein above the stethoscope is occluded. See figure 135. A continuous murmur is more likely to arise from an arteriovenous communication, such as patent ductus arteriosus. This murmur begins just after the first heart sound, crescendos throughout systole to envelop the second heart sound, and to decrescendo throughout diastole. This is a recording from a patient with a patent ductus arteriosus. Refer to figure 131. From the examples included in this record, it can be seen that a precise bedside diagnosis 
can be concluded for the vast majority of patients when the fundamentals of auscultation are understood. <laughs>